can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Dave Klein with North American Media. You could find them at namericanmedia.com. I'm gonna formally introduce Dave in a second. Dave, before I introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out. You know, I always say the fundamentals um, of marketing and business all come back to me to relationships and direct response. Okay. Whether you're talking to someone, whether you're writing an email, whether it's on a web page, it's moving someone into an action of some sort or asking them something. And so Dave is one of those people who has been in the trenches for decades uh, in direct response, has worked with some of the top people in direct response over the years. And so some of the past episodes you could check out are Brian Kurtz. Um, I had a couple episodes with him. I had Perry Marshall. I had uh, Caleb O'Dowd, uh, who Dave knows well, and Sam Markowitz. And there's many, many more. You can check them out on uh, inspiredinsider.com. Um, and this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We help you run your podcast. You know, for me, Dave, you know, you know me a little bit. The number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to do that than to profile the people and companies I most admire on my podcast and tell everyone and show everyone what they're working on, you know, so we could all learn. So if you've thought about doing a podcast, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com or email us support at rise25.com. And I was mentioning Dave Klein's the founder of North American Media, and he's a direct mail and direct marketing strategist and media buyer for, for mail, space advertising, direct mail, email. He's got over 30 years working with every type of business imaginable in every type of industry. And he really has a passion for helping people accomplish their customer acquisition goals, right? Which is the bottom line. So Dave, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Jeremy, for having me. Dave, Dave spoke at, you know, Brian Kurtz's mastermind, which I was at um, a couple weeks ago. And I'd love to hear, Dave, and we'll talk about your business and what you do, but who are some of your favorite direct response marketers of all time? Um, so I've worked with obviously quite a few. Um, Brian Kurtz, for sure, uh, has been a great mentor. Uh, Craig Simpson uh, has been a buddy of mine and a consultant and a strategist that I've worked with for probably the better part of 20 plus years. Um, I love copywriters. I mean, copywriters, because I, I found media, the, the, the other component of media, the other component of direct response success is copy. So a lot of the people that I've always kind of like have circled myself around or wanted to be a part of is just understanding copywriters and how they approach um, projects. And um, I have, you know, a handful of very close copywriter friends, Steve Wexler, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, but him and I were uh, best buds mm. and would often talk about packages and concepts and strategy and what should I do to, you know, hit these buttons and uh, always had a fun time um, collaborating together with him. Uh, I have a, a good friend of mine. Uh, another good friend of mine, Christopher Stella, who's an outstanding copywriter. Um, and so I still have, you know, like these kind of relationships and contacts with copy. Um, but there's tons of great copywriters out there, uh, Eric Betchel and Peter Betchel, and, and the guys that are still in the business, right? Because a lot of a lot of the, the senior, uh, amazing people in copy, of, of, I think a lot of them have kind of hung it up and they're leaving it to the new guys to to really uh, figure it out, but plenty of good examples out there of what copy works and what doesn't. Do you get questions about that? Like a company saying, listen, like let's say it's a nutritional supplement company or another company and say, hey, we want to run this campaign. Do you have a recommendation for a copywriter or do they usually have someone in-house or someone they, they work with? 
Yeah, I think we, we come up against both. It's kind of interesting. Uh, I had a recent conversation with a, a nutritional supplement company that was looking to um, try direct mails and media because right now they're 100% online. Uh, a lot of it's Facebook, uh, Instagram, Google, and of course, Amazon. And we were talking about the importance of, you know, the mail piece in terms of driving individuals and being benefit specific. And, um, but the cost to actually produce a mail piece is fairly expensive. And I think people get a lot of, they get sticker shock when they hear that they could be spending upwards of $20,000 for a full blown uh, 28 page, let's say booklet, which is very common in the nutritional supplement category in terms of prospecting pieces. So I held it up, you know, and I kind of showed them on the screen, you know, flipped through it and page, not page by page, but kind of page by page. And these, they're like, well, we have great copywriters. You know, they're really good at copy. And I think we could design pieces like that. So can't we just do it ourselves? I'm like, of course you could do it yourselves. The problem with um, taking on something like that is unless you really know what, it, what you're doing, mistakes are very expensive because essentially, you just threw all that money into postage and all that money into printing and all that money into list costs. And if you don't get a good return on it, then, I mean, it doesn't really matter whether I wrote it, you wrote it, or, you know, you, you want to remove the variables that can uh, affect the, the mailing the most in the worst way. And the two most important variables in any direct mail marketing program is the mail piece and copy. Design is a big part of that as well, and the list. And those have to marry together perfectly. There's tons of people in the business world who have done direct mail that have had bad results, and they're like, direct mail doesn't work, which is absurd because direct mail is one of the biggest media in the entire country in terms of uh, sales and in terms of actual just messages out there. Direct mail is huge, and it does work. But if you don't work with the people that know what they're doing, it doesn't work. I mean, so you know, you look at Google, right? I mean, I get tons of direct mail from Google, right? And, and they own online, essentially. Um, yeah, Facebook and is one of the biggest direct mail companies. So is Google, absolutely. Most of your major corporations that have huge online presences are doing direct mail and using direct mail now. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's been a very interesting change in that media. Uh, that, you know, I would say has really happened over the last five years. Where you're starting to see, you know, Peloton and DraftKings and Tommy John and DoorDash and Farmer's Dog and Freshly and you name it. Like, they're all mirror. They're all using direct mail now as part of their acquisition strategy. And it makes sense. I mean, as long as, you're, as, long as your ROI, your uh, cost of acquisition is comparable or less than another media, why would you forego mm -hmm. it? You know, there's no reason not to use it. And we're going to walk through some specific examples with specific companies. And then Dave's going to actually show some examples on the screen. So if you're watch, listening, you can watch the video uh, on Inspired Insider. Um, and we'll actually be sh walking through some of these things. Um, you know, I do want to mention, you know, people who are all online, these are some other strategies, some other avenues for you to acquire customers, right? So we're going to walk through some direct mail stuff that he's seeing, how it's changing, walk through space advertising. If you don't know what that is, we'll go over it. And there's just opportunity in alternative media and package inserts, and it will get the brainstorming juices flowing a bit. And I do want to mention, Dave, that Steve Wexler was awesome. I, I have had him on the podcast and we did an episode and he shared all, you know, may he rest in peace. He was just, it seemed like an awesome individual and he shared some great stuff uh, as far as uh, direct response copy and, and marketing yeah. in general. Yeah, he, he was brilliant. Um, so let's start with, um, a, just give people an overview a little bit about the company and what you do. When someone says, Dave, I want to work with you. What does that typically look like in, in your services? Yeah, so a traditional list brokerage, list management company represents data files, and they also identify those list sources that would be ideal for a direct mail campaign. By definition, that's the job of a list broker, right? So that's what I started doing when I first got into business. It's what I still do. But ultimately... So someone says, Dave, I have this product. I want to reach 
50 to 53 year old males in this demographic and X, X number of attributes and you would help them? Yeah, I try to find the perfect list or the perfect set of lists for them. Usually that you could tell by just looking at the male piece who their demographic is, right? So if you've had, got a lot of experience with these types of things, uh, you know, I remember back in my early days, this probably goes back into the late 90s, maybe early 2000s, um, I was working with Capital One credit card and we weren't working with their normal, you know, pre-approved credit card. It was very cool. They were doing very much at that time um, specific like uh, cards that would appeal to the, the category that we were mailing into. So they had like science, science fiction where the cards were all pictures of USO, UFOs and aliens and, you know, different celestial type images. And they would have a credit card series where they did it for dogs. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious, like if you're mailing a credit card with a dog theme to it, that you need lists of individuals that own dogs. You know, so my job is to go take that 80,000 different list universe and give me those 25 to 50, you know, hard hitting mail order buying dog lists and put and curate that together and there you go there's your universe and and so we would do that and it was probably about 15 20 different categories that we worked in um it was it was fun you know they would do all kinds of great uh, different types of cards they did birds and cats and uh cars you know like vintage automobiles um so it was a lot of fun uh you know we went out there and visited with them and we did a little brainstorming on on what markets would potentially be good for them right like you don't want to pick something where you may not have the ability to really find individuals um, uh, that would, you know, that that card would appeal to. So there's there's a lot to it. So you needed both, right? You need the, the marketing strategy. In this particular case, it was like looking for a very specific set of psychographics where their personal interests lie versus what's really available. Because if you can't get it, you don't want to mail it. You know, so that's that's part of it. Um, but just having a lot of experience and working with different mailers, I've been able to kind of raise the uh, definition of responsibility of what I do from just recommending a list to, hey, let's take a look at what you're doing. Let's see if we can improve on it. Like, why don't you have a website on your mail? Piece? Why don't you have an 800 number? Um, why don't you have any responsibility? Like right now, you're just branding. That makes no sense. Like, if you're going to spend the money to read someone, give them a means to respond. So, and there's a lot of testing that's going on with, you know, which one's optimized uh, over another. And a lot of times that depends on what it is, because if you've got the type of offer that let's just call it a good, better, best offer, you may do better by putting it into a call center because those agents are versed in the upsell, the cross sell, and trying to drive somebody into a website with a good, better, best, often they go for the, the lowest cost, which may not give them the most benefit in terms of value, but just they get that kind of, well, I'll try and see how this goes mentality, as opposed to really hearing the benefit of using the product and staying with it for a while, regardless of, of, of what the product is. And um, uh, subscription services are huge now in all direct response marketing uh, from, food companies to nutritional supplements to dog food companies to home repair um it's it's really uh a, kind of an exploding i won't call it a category but it's a means for, for monetizing the relationship with any customer build in a part as part of your model a subscription service so that you can make, you stay with you and develop more rapport and you really kind of have an opportunity to get greater lifetime value, which gives you an opportunity to spend a little more money to acquire the customer because of that back end lifetime value. So the first thing, Dave, really is, you know, you kind of analyze what they're doing and, you know, look at the, the different demographic psychographics to pair them with the appropriate audience and list. And then... Right. I'm sure there's variable things you do after that or sometimes are you, do they come with the creative or do you help with the creative? And then what happens after that? Yeah. So it could, it could, it's both, to be honest. Sometimes we don't do creative really in house. We recommend 
uh, copywriters, uh, designers, if, if need be, as well. Usually one goes with the other, but sometimes the copywriters uh, like specific designers working on their stuff, so they'll recommend a, a designer. But we work with printers and call centers. It's the whole chain. You know, we kind of need to know everybody and because we always get asked, who should we use for, who should we use for legal? Who should we use for merchant processor? Which CRM system should we use? Uh, who's a good printer with a good price that I could trust? So there's, we all, we get asked that pretty much for every project that we get involved in. So we kind of know the landscape too of who's out there and what they do. Yeah. yeah. And so after that, what happens next? So then they're ready to mail. So we'll, yeah. So we get a mail piece from our client, whether they produced it or, or we, or a copywriter produced it. At that point, we already know enough about it. So we can put together a mail plan based on the budget. So if you're mailing one list of 5,000 names, I'm looking for that one gem. If you're mailing 100,000 names, I'm looking for 20 lists with 5,000 apiece, you know, to get you the, 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 the best overall um, understanding of what the potential is of what it is you're doing. So if I mail one source, your potential is that's one source. If I mail 20 sources and 18 out of the 20 do well, now I could say, okay, well, we can go from 100,000 now up to 275,000. So where if I started with that one list, you'd be able to go from 5,000 to, I don't know, maybe 10, maybe 20. So, um, you know, understanding the client's budget uh, is very important, not only for that one campaign, but kind of like, what are they putting into this? What are they looking to get out? So part of um, a, a more robust campaign may not be just lists, it may be creative too. We might say, let's take two or three different uh, swipes at this using different creative going to the same names, not the same exact individual name, but the same source, and see if we can find a creative that works best. And then we marry that to the list that worked best. And then you've got something that's super optimized. Yeah, I could see. So you may take, let's say someone's like, I want to run a 15,000 person test and you'll take 5,000 from three different lists. And you'll be able to see, oh, wow, this blew it out of the word. This was okay. And this didn't work. And then they can scale up the lists that, that actually worked. That's right. Yeah. Or I could take 15,000 names from one list and we could use three different creative approaches because then I could say, okay, this list is like a lot of other lists that we can get for you, but let's find the creative approach that works best. Do we drive them to a, a, a landing page that kind of spells out the opportunity? Do you put it all in a mail piece and just use an 800 number for them to order? Um, you know, which, which, what's the strategy we want to try here? And a lot of that has to do with um, understanding the, the product, the complexity, the ease of it. Typically, the, the, the easier or less complex the product is to understand, the less you need in terms of creative. So DoorDash, for example, which is a piece that I have here, um, everyone knows what DoorDash is by this time. And so they could use a very simple mail piece, you know, a $5 off, uh, yeah. try DoorDash. And on your first time, you use that code right there and uh, you save yeah. $5. So if you hold that up for a second. So if you're, wa if you're listening only, Dave is holding up a DoorDash piece um, and, um, you know, it's basic, yeah. It's yeah, it's a large postcard. postcard. Yeah, a little bit of an oversized postcard. Probably, I would say it's probably four by six. And what's and, the uh, uh, the headline? The headline they have is restaurants come to you. Restaurants come to you. Your your favorite your favorite restaurants delivered. Really, the the whole thing is the five dollars off. Yeah, you know everyone knows what DoorDash is. It's just getting someone to take it, to take the risk, I guess, in trying it because a lot of people, you know, don't or maybe they use Uber Eats or another another brand uh, out there, so they they want to get on the phone. Yeah. So it kind of on that topic of um, where's direct mail going? How's it changing? So use a DoorDash. There's also, uh, I don't know if you want to pull up Bombas or Freshly or one of those or both yeah. to, to talk about what, so what they're doing. It's, it's, it's um, what's interesting and I, I'll, and I'll hold up some pieces is that because of online, uh, the way that we communicate in marketing and advertising is, is changing. Like online is developed in its own way, right? And the, its own strategies and methods. And 
how you want the website and things like that to look. And it was always competing with direct mail for advertising dollars. So money was moving away from direct mail, going into online, because online was like the wild frontier and you could get a new customer for three cents where a direct mail would cost you, you know, a buck 80 or $2 or whatever the case may be. So there was definitely revenue moving. And I, you know, got to experience all that and live through the whole thing and seeing, you know, budgets move. Oh, we're going to put more money into online and, you know, try some other things. Um, but what we're finding now is that because of the way online's developed and our overall familiarity with it, especially with Gen X's, uh, millennials, that they really can get very basic in terms of their direct mail strategy. And you get it. Like, they just want to put something cool in front of you. So, like, I just got this last week, which is kind of cool, Yeti, which is kind of a cutting-edge, you know, uh, company selling all kinds of, sorry, I'm trying to work the um, coolers. And these are all, like, you know, mugs and stuff. But it's just limited edition, designs for dad at yeti.com. Um, and driving obviously for Father's Day, I suppose, right? Because I just got this. Why they would send it to me? Being a father, I don't know. I don't know if I'd buy myself a cool dad uh, thing. But this is the type of thing where I I would love to engage with these types of companies and be like, let's just talk about the strategy. What are you trying to accomplish? Um, and like they should have been directing the list to females. X, Y, Z, right. Ages. So, cause yeah. you know, are you really going to, or are you really going to order yourself one of these things? Yeah. It could be that, or it could be just going to a young, or it could be going to cosmopolitan or, or, you know, Vogue or glamor where we know they, we know their dads are probably still with them and big part of their life. There's, there's lots of different strategies you could take, but also, you know, this is made for dad with just dad things on it where for me, I would have preferred to get a little bit more of a, sub, a substantive mail piece so I could see all the cool stuff that Yeti does. Cause I know Yeti's got some fantastic products, but right here, they're just showing, you know, the made for dad stuff, which is great. I mean, it's great branding. It's expensive to brand though. They're not a big call out in the, in the, uh, with the website. And, and if you're going to keep it this simple, I say QR code, just give me a QR code. I can point my phone at because, it, with this, with only this information for me, you know, I didn't make the effort to go to yeti.com and see what they have, but I know this wasn't the setup. It wasn't about these. It was about just getting me to the site. And I think there's easier ways to get it done. Um, and I think they could put a better foot forward, but whatever. It is what it is. I got that probably four or five days before Father's Day. Timing was off, too. Like, nobody could have ordered anything that actually would have shipped in time. Um, I, that, that, that I don't believe so. But other things that I'm seeing, so this is Tommy John, also postcard, big mail now. They're big online, they're big in TV. Um, and it's one of those names that's kind of a, a becoming a household name with men. And it's just 20% off, great call to action with the code. They put it on again in the back. Again, here, no, no uh, QR code. Um, but they just expect you to go to the, the website. And oddly enough, though it's hard to believe, they actually don't put the website on here. Oh, yes, they do. Visit TommyJohn.com. Sorry, they don't make it really obvious, but TommyJohn. If you have to search for it, there could be. I would have made, yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, I guess it seems a little odd to me. If anything, anytime you see a 20% off and a code, you know, where it tells you what the offer is, there's got to be a call to action there besides just the code and the, what you get. There should be an 800 number. There should be a URL. There should be a QR code because now I got to turn it over away from what I was focusing on and figure out what to do next. Um, DraftKings, very cool uh, mail piece that I got. There, you know, this online gaming is like just insane. start earning like, VIP course. status at DraftKings. Okay. Yeah, start earning VIP exclusive offers inside. You know, I don't know how exclusive they are, but you can see they can't, they kind of keep it fun. They keep it. I don't say it's it's light, but I think it kind of is. Um, they give you a few reasons why you should use DraftKings and what you can expect to get. You know, 100% deposit bonus up to 10 grand. That's great. 
uh, and they give you a promo code dice. They don't make a big display of it, but promo code is dice. I don't, you know, again, I, these things, these things, uh, they're great, but they could, you know, they, what does that develop. mean? Maybe I'm slow, but when they say a hundred percent deposit, are they, are they matching your $10,000? What does that mean? It does exactly? sound like it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if that messaging could it be says clear. It deposit amount and match amount require 15 time play through at different game contribution rates. So they, in very small font right there, they kind of have the disclaimer what right. what they actually mean when they say that. Got um, it. That does sound pretty, uh, pretty enticing though. Uh, Bombus. Uh, most comfortable socks in the history of feet, 20% off your first order. Bombas.com, there's the front of it. There's the mailable side, address side. And these have, uh, this is what's called known as a gated mail piece, which is kind of cool. They're, they're, they're going for a little more real estate here. So they've got uh, some lifestyle images, some copy, and, and then it opens up from there to even more uh, images and copies showing all the different socks that you can get, you know, and then that they, they, they donate uh, socks. That's one of their big things. They, for every sock, for every pair you purchase, they make a donation to individuals that need socks. So uh, pretty cool stuff. Um, you were mentioning farmers. Dave too, before, um, you know, talking about direct mail and um, athletic greens and super beats. I don't know if you want to talk about those. Yeah, so we're, I mean, the, the uh, nutritional supplement, dietary supplement marketplace has is typically for an older audience. It's typically a 50 plus audience. It's where you start really becoming concerned with your, your health problems and you're looking for the benefits of a natural alternative to, to uh, maybe prescriptions or maybe it's just not bad enough that you really feel like you need to go on a prescription, but you want to you know, get some help with um, natural alternatives. So people turn to nutritional supplements um, with all kinds of, there's so many of them out there, so many different ingredients. And that's why if you walk through a Walgreens or a CVS, it's pretty much at least one full aisle, if not two. Uh, and most of them are gummies these days, right? There's a lot of supplements and gummies. Um, but the, the the typical type of mail piece for that audience is, is it's kind of really this long form piece like this that goes into, um, you know, spread by spread by spread by spread by spread. And it's, there are about 28 pages of, or 24 pages of copy. And then at the end, there's an order form, or they try to drive you to an 800 number, as in the case in this particular piece here. And that's can you, can you hold that up again, uh, Dave, the yeah. cover again, just so I can I can see the so this is um, science to discover the source of neuropathy, discomfort and develop the breakthrough yeah. that uh, relieves it in just 15 minutes. And then this is a uh, multi Brings you relief in 15 minutes. Right. So that's what this product is. It's a it's a cream. It's got the that you can put on for nerve pain, lower leg health, and things like that, called Neurite RX. It's a very big seller, probably be in retail soon. And it's um, it's it's this, the typical format that you would expect to see for direct mail and has been that way for a very long time, whether it was, whether it's AARP that's mailing you to get a subscription or sign up for their membership. It's usually a, you know, a number 10 envelope uh, mailing that's going with a lift note inside of it, an order form, all the reasons why you should um, respond to the mail piece. Uh, Colonial Pen, Amer uh, uh, Publishers Clearinghouse, all you uh, disabled American veterans, all these long known, long standing, well known direct mail companies that have huge databases that have been doing it forever, even catalogers, the Williams Sonoma. They're sending you a 40 page catalog, Victoria's Secrets, uh, Dick's Sporting Goods, all have used and relied on this long form direct mail format. 
um, that is it's very expensive and it you know it's, it's not really new it's, there's nothing fresh about it what's interesting is a, a lot of online companies aren't you know like amazon started mailing the catalog of hit products so they went from you know being an online merchant to opening stores to mailing catalogs of best sellers you know so it's a lot of things are coming kind of full circle and that's why i say so what we're seeing in nutritional supplements is that there's this this desire or need to want to um give consumers information but keep it real simple with these kinds of you know branding themselves like a door dash would i suppose they don't have the household name yet but they're just trying to create that image in consumers mind find the ideal consumer that they're really looking for and then continuing to promote to them. So Athletic Greens is a green drink that gives you all your vitamins and nutrition once a day, and you're good to go. Very similar to Super Beats, which is somebody we're working with, and we're gonna, we told them right when we started, they weren't crazy about that long form, because they're like, I, we know customers are typically 60, 65 plus. We wanna get the benefits to the consumers in their 40s and 50s. 30s 40s and 50s but that type of long format doesn't appeal to that type of a consumer because they want it they want it quick they want to see what they're gonna you know what it's about they love it when there's name recognition and if they're online a lot and you're spending money online this is farmer's dog then perhaps there is another way so we're experimenting with it right now um hopefully we'll we'll everything's a test right everything's a test i mean I know from, uh, I know athletic greens, I've seen that piece a few times. Like somebody says to me, how do you know someone's working? Well, if you don't actually work with them yourself, then you know because of repetition of seeing the piece. So, um, and- Unless they're uh, not tracking, but hopefully they are tracking. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah unless they got a lot of VC money. <laughs> right. Let's talk about, so direct mail, a bunch of examples, um, and space advertising. What are people yeah. doing in space advertising? And for people who don't know what that is. Yeah, so space advertising is simply advertising in newspapers and magazines. Uh, that demographic is older as well. I mean, it's really a 50 plus. There are magazines, um, you know, your, your, um, uh, your, your people, even though people might be a little bit older, but Cosmo and Glamour and Vogue, but those don't really carry direct response ads. And we're talking about direct response today and customer acquisition. So they're branding and they ideally you're buying them, you know, they're trying to create a mindset within the consumer of what their brand is and how it is and how it's a part of their life or could be a part of their life. Um, but they're not driving to, to to website. They're not driving online traffic. So I think they probably will soon because I got to imagine most people, even you know people one off products at retail, would love the opportunity to just sell it directly to consumer. I don't know why they wouldn't. So I I would imagine at some point, pretty much every ad you see, even if it's a branding ad, will have a QR code at least, um, which will bring you right to the page where you can transact. I, I just don't know why marketers wouldn't do that. Um, you don't so what about anything. Unicoin? What are they doing? Yeah, so Unicoin, which is very cool, it's actually uh, a new coin that's not in circulation yet, but they're bringing it to market. And that's from uh, the Unicorn Hunters, which is on, you can see them on YouTube. Uh, Steve Wozniak, there's a bunch of really like high profile individuals, um, uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and moguls that kind of created this uni uni Unicorn Hunter which is a show kind of like um, uh, Shark Tank, uh, but a little bit more business-y business like. It's a little bit more uh, professional in some ways uh, and less promotional because they're really trying to get into the person's business. This, and it, I think they spend a little bit more time with it. They created this coin, this conceptual coin called Unicoin. And the idea behind Unicoin is to have it back an asset backed coin. So it's got a, it's a coin that pays dividends. It's a coin that's invested in companies, real companies, um, so that as those companies grow, the value of the coin appreciates. Very cool concept. So we did some uh, space advertising for them. Uh, major newspapers, you know, that's where you might get into a younger demographic and more of that mindset. 
um, uh, publications like Business Week. Uh, we ran it a bunch of times. So we, you know, typically we were running in newspapers probably three times a week. Uh, Washington Post, uh, you know, the New York Post, San Francisco Chronicles, all kinds of different papers, uh, Miami Herald, all different kinds of papers from around the country. And we were running um, like quarter page ads, um, very cool. And uh, just really showed the coin and website. Uh, they, they weren't offering uh, an opportunity to buy the coin. It was just getting uh, prospectus in your hand, making sure you were you were an accredited investor. And uh, we were doing we were running quite a bit of media for them until the uh, the cataclysmic fall off in Bitcoin prices. But hopefully that that comes back around. What were they yeah. hoping to accomplish with that? Just getting people aware to invest in the coin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure they took investments in it as well. But you've got to they've got to get the the overall um, uh, uh, investment in it to, I think, actually launch it. So I don't have the details on the prospectus yeah. and how it all works. But, yeah, it was basically to generate interest, <laughs> um, get a viable audience of people that were interested in making the investment and then get themselves to a point to actually go to launch. Mm. Of the coin. I'll have to check out that show, Dave. Yeah. I'm looking it up, unicornhunters.com, and they have all the information yeah. there. Yeah, got a lot of they got a lot of YouTube. Interesting. So I think that's where they feature all their shows. So there's opportunities in newspapers and in magazines, um, and well, what about- that's a product. Yeah, we work with AAG um, in newspapers and magazines, uh, which is a reverse mortgage company, and uh, they've done quite well. But I've seen. You know, there's there's uh, you know people like Fisher Investments, which is a big money manager, takes half a million. It. They run all the time newspapers. Um, lots of you know the walk-in tubs. It's again, it's an older audience. You're not going to, you know, forty to fifty. You're going to fifty plus. And then there's alternative media package inserts. Um, uh, Eureva RX. Yeah, yeah, that's another client of ours. Uh, package inserts. Um, gives you an opportunity, they've been around forever, to go into the outgoing packages of companies um, as a third-party advertiser to get your marketing materials delivered. And I think that the concept is really, I'm going to go to a consumer and send them this box. And this box is going to cost me $20. If I could take $2 off the cost of the box by throwing in other advertisers, why not? I mean, it just makes it a much more profitable business to be in. So package inserts really are you taking your marketing message and sending it out in other people's boxes. And you get to choose which companies, like a mailing list, I get to choose which companies' boxes I want to go in. And so- What's cool yeah, about, about that, Dave, is like, that's a buyer, right? So they're getting in front of a buyer yeah. who's already purchased something. It's not someone who's, you know, kind of- kicking a tire, they've already purchased something. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. But you're also get, not just getting a buyer uh, from someone that's purchased something, you're getting to reach them when they have the best mindset possible, which is cool. My, my stuff finally came and they open it up and they're gonna look at everything in the box. It's just, you know, natural. It's yeah. just nature for that. So this was this is like what a package is. Again, very simple. It's, it's one sheet folded down and if needed to be folded again to go inside whatever envelope it is. Yeah. You'll see a strong offer, have up to two free bottles, call this 800 number. It's all over the piece so you can't miss it. I mean, that's the way to do it. Testimonials on the back, guaranteed to work or it's free. So you got a strong guarantee on it. Backed by clinical studies, clinical testing research, yada, yada. So, and this is for, a, that was for a bladder type of supplement. That's for, yeah, so, it's for bladder control, right, absolutely. So it's a nutritional supplement for bladder control, yeah. So what would what would they insert it with? Like a box of Depends? I mean, no, that, that would probably be competitive and, and I mean, it would do phenomenally well, right? If I could get Depends to take those inside. <laughs> Their, uh, if not a box, their, you know, their actual uh, wrapping. At the it may retail. ruin their the the rebuys if people buy yeah. that and it works. And yeah, so there, there we were going into things like 
um, Dr. Leonard's and Carol Wright, kind of like uh, a Miramark uh, catalogers with an older demographic for sure, you know, 40 plus. We tried a bunch of different things. Almost everything we did worked, which is great. Um, but that it's a it's a really good media. It's fairly inexpensive because you're not you don't have heavy print costs. You have no postage. Um, you just have a small insert fee and uh, the printing of those. But we've actually gone and reached out to the market where we have an advertiser that's very unique and they want to go into boxes that are unique. And we approach them on a one off basis where it's not. It's not, they may not take any inserts at all. So we we think of it in a different way. It's more of a partnership where we're like, hey, we really want to be in your box. You're going to 10,000 people. Like we just structured one of these for a client that it hasn't happened yet. So I don't want to name who they are. But we're like, we'll pay $1,500 to go to those 10,000 people, which is a lot. But for them, for the client that wanted to go into that box, for the branding opportunity to reach that audience, it's worth it to them. So there's, it doesn't have to always monetize at first. It can be just, you got a core group of individuals, you know who you want to reach. Package and search gives you a means to do that. And unlike the email box, like I said, and like you said, you got a consumer who's opening that box, they're digging in with both hands, and they're going to see that package, they're going to open it up. And hopefully it's of like-minded, non-competitive, but like-minded opportunities to try something new. Um, Dave, I have a question. So like, there's a lot of B2C from a B2B standpoint, let's say someone wanted to target, you know, a 40 to 50 year old person that is, I don't know if you can target a position at a company like C-suite or CEO over a certain salary range um, or revenue. How, what would you, how would you think about that? Yeah. So the B2B market's entirely different than the consumer, but in many ways it's the same. So B2B is primarily composed of, there's a lot of government records on companies, uh, the size of the company, employee size, sales volume, Dun & Bradstreet's out there with credit information and also all that good information on the company size and sales. <clears throat> Every company has a designated SIC code, it tells you what industry they work, they work in. So it's, it, the list business is very good at identifying companies. It's also good at identifying individuals where those individuals do something like the consumer side, but in the B2B world, they're joining associations. They have a membership to a particular group of professionals. They read uh, paid and they read controlled circulation magazines that are industry or trade publications. Um, that, and, and usually with those controlled circulation or paid publications, they know a lot about that individual because usually that individual has to qualify. So they got to write what they're, they got to check the box of their title, the size company, the industry, um, the employee size. So those are still out there in abundance. Uh, but a lot of that, a lot of that kind of marketing too has moved online, but um, with a, a, a much better quality uh, of media than what we see in the consumer side, which is email. So in a B2B environment, email is very good, especially if you know the source that you're working with, because typically individuals, when they get an email from their membership company or association that they belong to, they're going to look at it because it's coming from somebody that they trust. It's a group that they're part of. And those emails typically carry uh, third party advertisements, either as banners or embedded uh, URLs or even just a third party straight email and they just endorse the company that's that's sending it out. So can you generate lists for then people to email or will you partner with those companies and go, hey, you'll send the you'll send yeah. give the email copy and they'll have to send it out on their on their behalf. Yeah, that's typically the way it's done uh, for it to be kind of can spam compliant. The email needs to originate from the owner of the data. So what typically happens, which is the way you want it anyway, like for you to take an email list and send it coming from the server that none of, nobody's email recognizes, it's just going to go into spam folders. So you really do want to send your advertisement to the company to have them 
deploy it through their servers, your message with their their banner at the top for recognition. And again, it's an it's an implied endorsement. So that's that's the way that is done. Um, Dave, first of all, I have one last question, but before I ask it, I want to point people to check out um, namericanmedia.com to learn more about what you do and to check it out. Uh, if you have questions specifically for Dave, they have a contact us. You can go there or call their number. Um, and so, Dave, thanks for sharing the stories and walking us through um, some real specific examples. I wanted to just end with um, uh, you had a health scare and what happened, because I think it's pretty inspirational. And we were talking before we hit record is if someone didn't have the right mindset, it would be this would be severely debilitating for someone. Yeah, I, I believe that to be the case. Uh, but what happened? Devastating, depressive. <laughs> um, I went into the hospital in November of 2018 with the flu. And uh, by the good grace of God, I ended up staying over. But I, I, I got what's called sepsis. And I got a very bad form of sepsis while I was in the hospital uh, called DIC. And DIC has got a very low success rate or survival rate. It's only about 8%. And those people that do survive typically have very bad health problems afterwards. It could be kidney, uh, bladder. It could be all kinds of different organ uh, failures, which I actually was going through. But luckily, I came through um, without any issues as it pertains to the organs, my organs. But I did go through and receive amputation. So I had fingers uh, amputated. I think my uh, ring finger and my thumbs, I kind of have, but the other ones are all, were all, I lost the first, uh, the first part of them. And then I'd be, I'm a double amputee. I mean, you know, I had to learn to walk again. I won't put them both up there, but it's yeah. the real, the real deal there. Below knee, luckily, uh, if there's a lucky thing to have with an amputation on your leg. Uh, below knee because above knee is, uh, from what I hear, that much more difficult. But uh, and you know, I just it, with anything for me, I'm a silver lining kind of guy. It's one day at a time. Uh, you get up and you just fight the day and and try to improve with whatever it is you're doing. So it's uh, you know it's really a, a strive and thrive uh, mindset and. Um, you know, I try to do everything that I used to do. I, I, I haven't, I haven't challenged myself with skiing yet. I honestly am kind of glad that I never have to do that again. <laughs> uh, wasn't one of my favorite uh, activities. I enjoyed it for many different reasons, but I, I could let that one go. Mentally, uh, Dave, what were you thinking that helped you get, like you said, like it's an eight percent survival, and then even after there's long-term yeah. repercussions. How did you process that? Uh, I think you I think you start with I'm happy I'm alive. I you know I have daughters. Um, I I love life. Um, I love their lives, and I love being in their lives. And I think that's you know it's just a starting point for getting yourself in the mind the right mindset to tackle uh, this kind of obstacle or hurdle in life. And I just never, you know, I just was, it was pretty much for me, what do I need to do next? What do I need to do next? And I was in the hospital for 60 days before I moved to rehab. And I went to rehab without prosthetics that were being made for me at the time. I spent 90 days in total between the hospital and rehab, 30 days in rehab before I left. Um, but I remember on February 11th of uh, 2019, my prosthetics were coming. And now I'm, I'm probably at this point, 75 days uh, without standing, 75 days in bed, either no legs or knowing that I wouldn't be able to stand again because the, 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 my uh, appendages, my feet had, had deteriorated so badly that I wasn't going to walk again. And I was like a kid getting a bicycle at Christmas. I did not feel like a kid getting a bicycle at Christmas when I tried to stand in them. But the excitement of knowing they were coming that day was pretty cool. 
I was actually really jazzed up about it because I was like, it may suck, but at least I'm going to get to stand and walk and I'll figure it out. And it did. It was, it was, it's very painful. I mean, to this day, it's, it's not, I can't, it's like, if I had to describe it, the first time standing with something like this would be like being, uh, I, I, what I would envision would be what I am, a 55, 53 year old male standing up in high heeled shoes with a shoe size that's two times too small. Like, it's just like walking, standing, no part of it, didn't want anything to do with it. I'm like, this is horrible. Um, and then you just go from there. And the next thing you know, now for me, other than bad days here and there, if I, if I hurt myself a little bit um, or I overdo it, it's kind of like walking around in ski boots that go up to your knees. I don't know how, you know, that's probably the best, easiest. You know they're there, you feel it all the time. It's a lot of pressure, but it's a, it's a pressure you're used to. So I try not to let it bother me. And I just, in, in terms of my psyche, I just do the right next best thing for myself. Yeah. Dave, thank God you survived. And thank yeah. you for sharing your journey and your expertise. Everyone should go to anamericanmedia.com, learn more, check out more episodes of Inspired Insider and rise25.com. And, and Dave, thanks so much. My pleasure, Jeremy. Good being with you. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.